All right. We are live. Okay. First, I'd like to apologize. We're about an hour late, so we're going to get right in this. Uh, we'll call this uh, committee meeting together. First item, we'll approve the minutes of the uh, June 22nd Tourism and Oxy Tax Coordination meeting. Do I have a motion? I'll make so, that motion, Mr. Chair. <laughs> <laughs> Chairwoman Sieber, Supervisor Beatty, what any the, discussion on the minutes? The lawyer get involved. All those in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Opposed, Garrett. All right. Mike doesn't have his uh, revenues for Axi tax. They had a glitch in the uh, treasurer's office. We have three grant applications that were put in before we changed our, our uh, grant form. We haven't acted on these because two of them take place in 20, uh, 2022 and one takes place in this year, in 2021. So my first question is the committee. These are complete applications under the old application. Um, Kristen and Joanne have gone through them, I believe with Lisa, and they all agree that they're, they're valid applications. My question of the committee, and I'll read which they are, what they are. New York State Ski Education Foundation which takes place in um, North Creek, New York. Um, that's a 2021-22. They're asking for $15,000 and it's held at Gore Mountain. And I guess it's been going on for years, but we've never been asked to fund it. That's one application. The uh, next application is a February 22 uh, event. And then that will be held in Lake George. It's Lake George Music Festival. They're seeking $9,000. And last but not least, February 22 is the Lake George Winter Carnival, which happens every year, it didn't happen last year. And they are seeking $45,000 in oxy tax. Now, the only application we should act on would be the New York Ski Foundation application this year, if the committee wants to do that, or we can send these uh, forms back to the applicants and say, redo them under the new application form. What is your pleasure? Discussion, yes. If I'm understanding you correctly, you're recommending that we address the NYSEF, that's the New York Ski Education Foundation, the NYSEF, and and we, I'm just clarifying what you just said. And What's that? If I understand you correctly, you're, you're recommending we address the New York, the NYSEF, the New York Ski Education Foundation, and put the other two well, I would recommend we do all three, but if you want to send the other two back to be redone, um, we can. Only the one that really is necessary today is the New York Ski Foundation. So going forward, our process will be anything that's in next year we'll address in November, December, correct? I believe that's what we have for the time frame. I think we should start to, to uh, model that consistency now. So you want to send these back and make them redo them under new applications? Yeah, I don't know. I hate to ask people to redo them, but yeah, I guess. Okay. That's why I brought up to committee. You have a question? No, I'm for that. Super, super. Thank you, Chairman Garrity. Um, I don't see these applications in the packet. They're not because oh, okay. we. I was asking if oh, they okay. wanted to applicate. App yeah operate on them or do you want to redo them um well i wouldn't be prepared to vote on something that i haven't seen so it would be great i think to have them fill out that if your committee passes the application today i would say well there's only in. four of us here so i guess we're saying that we want them to redo them yeah. okay so we'll send these back to the applicants and tell them to redo them according to the new form right yeah. including the four applications mm -hmm. which is for beginning of december to be clear, NYSEF I, operates at Gore and West Mountain. Okay, um, yeah. But yeah, I, I, you know, I, I, I would say yeah. yeah okay, I'll uh, send them back with, and you'll take care of it. Okay, I thank you. Heard them, hmm? they won't yeah. hurt. Okay, we have the CBV report, the quarterly report. Uh, Gina, please. Thank you, Chairman Garrity. Mm -hmm. um, so in your agenda package you had our full q2 report so what i'm presenting today is a bigger picture of that more of um, a broad brush so thank you for having me today uh, so what i'll present is 
you know, basically what we've done over the last three months. So that would be April, May, and June, and what our outcomes are and our sales and marketing activities. So when we get to um, the slide that has, Q, you can see in the package in front of you that has the Q2 outcomes. So basically our, this quarter, we looked at last year of how we all work together collaboratively, specifically the, um, if you'll go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, if, when we were la this time last year or in that quarter, uh, working with Warren County Tourism, we looked at when was advertising happening. And so when we looked at our strategic plan, we wanted to take advantage of that brand awareness in the Northeast uh, from an advertising perspective and then roll in all of our meeting and convention marketing and advertising with that. So a lot of that happened in this quarter to, to coincide with the advertising of Warren County Tourism. So with that brand awareness, you'll see some of our marketing numbers shortly as we move on. Throughout this time period, we also had um, made, you know, we of uh, 15 out of 27 leads uh, came through in this time frame. So it, things are opening back up where people are looking to book business in the future and they're actually get, sending us their RFPs. We're also able to, um, do a lot of convention services with in this quarter uh, for both pre-event marketing for Women on Wheels, as well as a lot with Blinker Fluid that was here. And then a lot of smaller referrals that you would see in the full Q2, everything from who we worked on from welcome bags or, or whatever it was, all of those smaller things. Um, On-site assistance, you know, that happened for several events as well as um, post-con. So those are things that we've been working on for book business. Chairwoman Sieber did ask for us to start providing after action reports on certain business. So we have designed um, specific uh, post-con questionnaires for both meeting and event planners as well as the venues. So those will be coming shortly. And that was really based on the blinker fluid because their, their after action or their, their post-con was very, um, uh, was very in depth. And I think that that was sent to everyone in the Warren County Tourism and passed along to many of our committee members. And then lastly, serving partnerships throughout this, this quarter, um, continuous communication, both internally and externally, as well as um, meetings, whether it was meetings with clients, but also one-on-ones um, handholding our community partners and then development and, and where we're going with that. So moving right along to our outcomes. So lead generation, as I mentioned, 15 of the 27 leads that, that were sent were actually generated in this quarter, so far year to date. Face-to-face um, -face meetings, so those have begun again. Um, when I mean that, what I mean by face-to-face -face meetings is actual, we've actually gotten to go to networking functions um, whether it's a meeting professionals international of upstate New York chapter meeting to just recently, we just went to, um, an actual trade show. So those are opening up again, where we can actually interact more with p potential clients and, uh, clients who've already had business here and trade shows. Those are opening up. We had both a virtual trade show as well as a live trade show so far in this quarter. Um, destination marketing, contact collection, uh, as you will have seen in our full report, we were able to, um, through our digital meeting guides, our blog, our affinity marketing, um, we've been able to collect more contacts. Normally this time we would be doing that because we've gone to face-to-face -face meetings and trade shows where you, you're meeting new people and you're adding to your database of prospective clients. So we did that virtually or you know digitally, if you will, throughout this time frame. Our digital marketing traffic, um, and again, this is all being back on course. Uh, you'll see actually in another slide how much we've been been able to generate through to Warren County Tourism Visit Lake George. And lastly, venue features. We've been featuring more of our venues to get that word out, whether it's, you know, the, all of the things that you can do now to renovated um, Georgian to um, what's happening at uh, the Queensbury Hotel to um, what is available from an, an amenities perspective at, let's say, Six Flags Lodge. So those features are getting a lot more play 
um, as we drill down, because we know that our meeting and event planners, the features and amenities are very important now, much more so than they ever were to um, potential attendees. And lastly, the evolved messaging. So in the advertising that we began early in the year, it was all were open safely and, and, and that's all well and good. People are expecting that now, especially those future clients. Now we've, moved, we've um, evolved to smaller is better, easier, less travel, less hassle in coming here. Sales and services activities. As I mentioned, leads bookings lost and pending business. That was all part of your um, the Q2 full report that was with the agenda. Referrals throughout that time were um, seven, 17 referrals on behalf of clients. So meaning that 17 clients had referrals and, and it might've been to more than 17 properties or um, services. So for instance, if we were looking for fields for, let's say, um, a, ba a baseball tournament, we would have looked at four or five different potential venues, but it was on behalf of 17 clients. So it, the, the numbers get exponential when you look at that. Our highlights, many of you were involved in the Ice Castles visit that, that was here back in April. And since then, there's been many things that have happened since then. Um, disabled American vets came for a major site tour. Um, they eventually booked. And they're um, right now they had already added another 75 rooms to the room block based on their booking with Six Flags. For their, their meeting is not until 2023, but already the buzz is out there that they're coming to Lake George and specifically at the indoor water park. The Jeep invasion, as you know, um, was here very successful. And now we do have the numbers from it generated over $78,000 in um, earned advertising just based on their PR from that. And lastly, women on wheels, while they were just here, um, I did want to throw in that number, their um, PR generated 60 grand so far in the in earned media for that event while they were here in town. And hopefully many of you saw those women on wheels throughout the county because they were all over the place last week. Um, throughout this period, we also launched a, a new website um, and with the blessing of Joanne, so we took our um, like Visit Lake George, but Meet Lake George, we designed a website so that it basically mimicked the, the website of Visit Lake George. And so throughout this period, we've been able to generate um, close to 840 views to visit Lake George. In the past, up until this time, prior to us launching Meet Lake George, we were averaging about 300 page views going to visit Lake George. Now, we, we just in the month of June, it was 840. So we've added some things to certain spots on Meet Lake George so we'll know those exact analytics and make it easier to showcase that. So we're looking and we're able to drive people to um, visit Lake George from a calendar, from an event, and not just to meetings. So it's it's been really helpful. Um, our state, regional, national publication schedule. So a lot of that advertising began in the late May, all of June. Um, to, again, to dovetail, as I mentioned earlier, with the advertising that's happening through um, the brand awareness of Visit Lake George. And throughout this um, time frame, community development was press, hiring, uh, Lake George's hiring.com, and our partner showcasing. So I mentioned, you know, some of those marketing outcomes, the website traffic, uh, a lot of growth throughout um, uh, on visitlakegeorge.com. We exceeded the benchmarks on some of our national advertising, and re when I say national, but really regional. Um, so for instance, we had um, launched a campaign through North Fork, North Forker on Long Island, knowing that there was digital and television advertising in that market. And that um, was to reach those folks that actually have corporations in Manhattan, which we can't afford to reach them in Manhattan, but we could reach them in their homes. And so, and dovetailing again on advertising that was already taking place. So that, um, those, I don't have all of those specs yet, but I will um, when that campaign is finished. But we were, we've been very pleased with how we've exceeded, whether it's click-throughs and page views and everything of what we've done with regard to that. 
And lastly, our, our inquiries are coming in through newsletters, website, blog, and convention services. So again, all of those are, are delineated line by line on the full page or the full report that we submitted that's with your agenda. Lastly, community development, our ongoing efforts. Um, if you'll notice um, on that, um, uh, go back one slide. Thank you, Tammy. Um, the visitor champion, this is a logo that just became a pin. It just arrived this morning, actually, before I came. Um, uh, for those who have taken our tourism awareness training program. And so um, this is just a piece of our ongoing um, community development. So destination partner resource, you know, we're still holding monthly meetings. We know that July was a really slow month or not slow, but people are too busy to actually come to our July meetings. Um, um, but definitely they're, they're needing everybody's help this time, especially with not only hiring, but also with regard to dealing with the challenges of visitors, pent up demand. And as um, many of you are aware that we're working on signage to replace that, um, don't make us ask, wear a mask, but something that, you know, unwind, you know, be kind, welcome we we want you here but we need you to be patient because um life is short and <laughs> so is staffing um so more news to come on that um public relations you know again uh working together with everybody around the county to keep us uh, just out there and and aware of everything that we have to offer here and lastly arrival to departure training so in this time frame we trained 51 people Right now, we've kind of laid low with July and August. Again, it's just really busy, busy um, for all of our destination partners. Um, we've also increased the promotion and marketing materials with regard to that. And the pin was one of them as another way to, to make people just excited about being a, a visitor champion. And um, lastly, Lake George's hiring, uh, that's been uh, paid in organic outreach. Again, those numbers are in your full packet. And um, and so that's that's gone well, but right now we're trying to come up with a way that we can ascertain the ROI on that Lake Georges hiring.com site. Uh, we tried to get some folks to tell us, well, did you have anybody apply for a job that was within that 20 to 75 mile radius based on their zip code? We have not gotten any feedback on that yet. So more news to come on that. Um, partner service and support has really just been handholding. Um, everything from, okay, should I be making, do I need to be the, the mask police when I have a wedding? I know some people are unvaccinated and then they're taking off their masks during, whether it's dancing or during the wedding, once all of the restrictions were lifted. So we're still making sure that those guidelines are being followed as much as they can um, and making, and they've put those, restrictions, if you will, not restrictions, but some of that onus on the bride versus, you know, when the restrictions were lifted off the venue. But on the meantime, we do have several venues that are still trying to keep their staff safe so that we don't see those spikes because that is coming up, especially because there's so many weddings that are still hap that are happening and more to come, especially as we get into the fall. Moving forward for Q3, um, um, just a quickly we have live face-to-face -face tra trade shows that are moving forward and are happening um so this is a, a quick schedule july 15th i just came i was in boston on thursday i had 12 out of 17 potential appointments and then be, be, i was able to network with the other folks that were there august 12th we're we're working on um a, a luncheon with all of our state partners um to have that in albany of meeting and event planners Connect Marketplace, that will hit the association market, uh, some of the sports and then the specialty market. We've seen some great um, inroads with the, the affinity market. We talked about reunions and those kinds of things that will be there. And lastly, we do have a um, SA, which is the Empire State Society of Association Executives. And that annual conference was is typically in June, that was moved till September. Our routine sales and services activities, we're, when I say routine, we're, we're getting back into the routine. People are expecting that um, uh, in terms of our sales activities and pre-event marketing and public relations and on-site assistance for meetings. 
Uh, we're already working on, you know, everything to find a speaker for a uh, reunion that's coming up in September to other uh, welcome bags for a group that are here um, at the Queensbury later this weekend. And then post event evaluation, more news to come on that as we um, work on that from a from an ROI standpoint to to prepare for after action reports to give to this committee. And we'll continue with our advertising and marketing um, that we have already in our marketing plan that was shared with the committee um, earlier this year. Any questions? Yeah, I, uh, you know, I know weddings was one of the big, big items that was looked at in 2021. How do you think uh, the amount of events has measured up to where you thought, where you thought you would be uh, in 2021 on weddings? Um, so uh, in your, in the, uh, the information that was sent on the Q2, which I was in your in that I, I didn't bring that full report with me, but in there we could already see that the number of weddings booked for 2022 is far exceeded where we thought we would be, um, because our goal was to grow back the eight percent that we were losing based on 2016. But we can't take credit for everything because there's so much pent up demand and so many things got pushed from 2020 to 2021 and then to 2022. So I, I'm looking at that 2023 number because now we did we ran a program between November and February and early March of just focused on weddings once our digital wedding kit was done. And so we were able to capture that information from potential brides and um, and so since then, we've marketed to them the other services that are here and the venues in their own newsletter. And then uh, my second question would be on, on the new businesses, what, what are you mainly focusing on for new businesses? So new business, we're, we're um, focused on meetings and events, meetings specifically um, in that association world and, and corporations. Okay. So there's repeat sports business that comes. There's a there'll be a few new ones. We're talking to a flag football group tomorrow. We have a conference call with them in Golden Goal, as well as um, a lacrosse, uh, which Chris would know about. Began conversations a couple years ago that's been in Lake Placid that is looking to move. So so you know one of the businesses that used to be uh, pretty prepare business we're associations school mm -hmm. boards yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, that type of things and different associations so you you see that picking up again and are we making a play for that yes um and in that market um uh so that i'm glad that you asked about that because right now some of them from a government perspective not everybody is still able to travel right. or there's no travel budgets for them or they're being put back in mm -hmm. some of that from so so let's say from a government perspective there are some counties that were almost bankrupt that, you know, are they able to travel? So, but there is state associations that are, that are rebooking Starting. and yes. Okay. So, and some of it, like we were really pleased that like even the business council of New York state is coming back to the Sagamore this fall. They don't know that their numbers will be at, as they were in 2019, but that's an annual meeting that's always been there. Um, I know Amanda Allen, her association is looking to come back. Um, which they were booked to come um, again at the Sagamore. Uh, we have um, police chiefs at um, um, at the Queensbury Hotel. They're the ones who have a buyout of the Boathouse Restaurant this Sunday, this coming Sunday night. So there are those that are right. coming back. Now, are their numbers what they were in 2019? I don't know that answer yet. Um, and just in talking to, let's say, the Queensbury on that police chiefs where they were sitting for the number of attendees uh, a week and a half ago compared to uh, this week, they've had like 30 more reservations. And we saw the same thing just happen with our Women on Wheels group. They had 68 new people that came and that booked like in the last 10 days prior to their conference. So, you know, we were really pleased about that, you know, just because people are like, well, should I go? Should I not go? So we're, we're also dealing with that right now. It may seem different, you know, as, as we get later in the year. Crazy. Yeah. Um, anybody on the committee, any questions, Doug? Yeah, I've got uh, a supervisor, right, Beatty. Sorry. That's all right. Uh, I got a couple of questions. Um, and maybe it's Joanne, maybe it's you, I'm not sure. So, Grayscape announced they're closing Tuesday. Yeah. So I'd like to know from you two professionals, do you have any gut feelings on how that will affect maybe events that we're planning that, you know, that you, 
actually come to the area thinking, hey, we're going to go to the Great Escape and you know, they get the inexpensive rooms on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and now, you know, we find out yesterday they're not, they're not going to be open. Yeah, well, first of all, I don't know that our rooms are that inexpensive on Tuesday, Wednesday, <laughs> okay. Thursday right now. I was trying to be positive. No, I, no, no, I mean, I only say that because yeah. there was a level of customer that came this time last year that were not as respectful as right. previous well, no, years. I, I remember the Right. So I'm being trying to be nice yeah. about this. So we're seeing, if you've seen those rates have gone up and up and up, you know, and, and we can see that on our dailies, you know, that we're seeing that, that um, the average daily rate has continued to climb. Um, I mean, there's days when the Sagamore has $1,100 rates. Yeah. So with that, I think that we'll see um, less, uh, and I, I got asked this by the newspaper, the Times Union, we'll see less of that back and forth between Saratoga, us, you know, them coming here because there's a dark day. They might have come, you know, that, that they were already here. Some people will be very upset. I know that in talking to Jennifer Mance, she, I talked to her offline and she said that they have tried to make sure that their customers know that they're closed on those two days so that they could give them better service, have more rides open longer on those other days. Because what was happening is on a, any given day, because of the less staff, they might have had one ride open for two hours and then they moved the staff over to open another ride. And, and so you didn't get the full experience because you were waiting online and hoping that you actually got on that ride that you wanted to, especially that new ride. So I think that we'll have some very upset people until this blows over. Now, she did say yesterday on a call we were on that if they were able to hire some more folks that towards the in August, that they would open, they would see what day they could open. But right now they're operating at less, right around 50% of the staff that they need to operate. Okay, um, and then my second question, uh, Mr. Sorry. Chairman, is uh, with ice castles, mm -hmm. okay, and we're anticipating 100,000 plus. Now, a number of motels or hotels close in the wintertime. And we have X amount, of, we always get a winter clientele and so mm -hmm. forth. So I guess what I'm thinking is, and I, it's a good thought, will we have enough rooms for an anticipated major event that I think is going to be real earth shaking for this area? Well, that is a very good question because last year, Spectrum changed their fees. So for instance, you know, we've had a lot of hotel motels that would open in February for Winter Carnival. And they could go on a month to month basis and turn on their internet and their cable for that month. Mm -hmm. Well, Spectrum changed their seasonal rates. So now you're either open for a year or you're open for six months. So the Greenhaven Resort, for instance, said, I can't open in February because I'm not going to open for all six months. I'm not going to pay for the whole year. So that will deter some of those properties that would normally open just for even weekends. So then on the flip side, with Ice Castles opening and, and having, let's say, Wednesday business that would be overnight, we might see some folks that no matter what, they're open year round, but they may only open Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Fort William Henry or Sagamore. Maybe they'll open on Wednesdays to get us that extra night in. So I don't really know. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, it's I was just wondering what yeah. you was because. But just, I, I want everybody to understand that we have some issues now with spectrum because right. that is a big deal. Mm -hmm. And the worst scenario is these people do want to come yeah. and they got nowhere to go. They got nowhere to you know sleep for the night. Well, and and to your point, we'll do we'll we'll probably be you know on steroids of of those properties that we're promoting that are open year round, branded properties that are open seven nights a week, right. um, you know, because we do have them, right. and um, you know it will be those you know we'll have to push those properties first and foremost. Okay, so it's really just a wait and see type of thing. It really. is I, unfortunate. Yeah, Joanne. Thank you. Uh, and Ice Castle's uh, ticket sales are online. So, you know, the thought process is that people go online, they look for their tickets, they look for rooms available. And I thought that there was a price differential between midweek and weekend. So maybe then the task is to us to promote that midweek visit to fill those rooms midweek and make it a little bit easier for 
um, people plan their visits. So, you know, there'll be some uh, learning curves the first year, but I, mm -hmm. I think that'll all be good. And hopefully they're here for three years. That's the plan. And we'll work that out in the long run. And, you know, to your point, Joanne, um, um, I just, while we were waiting. <laughs> I got the email that they're coming next Wednesday. Um, and we'll talk to them now to, you know, to that point of, okay, how in that booking process of their, of that, do we make sure that right away they we're getting that customer to information about rooms mm -hmm. so that we'll have a better idea of that. You know, now's the time for us to be talking about that and brainstorming, you know, the best way to do that. And they did share their marketing plan, so we'll work closely with them on their marketing to be sure we're in the same markets and the messaging is the same across the board. Thanks. Any any other questions from committee members? Okay, thank you, Gina. Thanks. Okay, Jeff, you're up with Civic Center. A cool arena. I better. Yeah. Uh, get, thank you. I don't want to get oh. found it. So. Oh, well, well, it's good to be back here. I think it's been a year and year and change. So. Um, I did email everybody uh, a packet of us to what's been going on. Obviously, quarter one was pretty quiet at the arena, um, and most of quarter two was quiet. Um, we did have some ice in for uh, for the first three months of 2021, and then the farmers market. Then we we're able to open up again in early June um, without restrictions, which was great news. And we we're fortunate, um, as you, you certainly you can see, you know, we hosted uh, three dance events on uh, three different weekends, which were really good. So you can tell by the attendees, the first one, 1,300 people showed up for two days. Um, the second one, about 240, and the third event, um, 260 attendees. So um, then again, we, we hosted South High's graduation, Queensbury's graduation, and Glens Falls' graduation. Again, about 6,000 people showed up for those uh, three days downtown of Glens Falls. And then kind of the last moment, we were able to book uh, an event called Dance Explosion, which is a, a dance competition. We had it for five days at the arena. As you can see, we booked at least over 700 hotel rooms midweek due to the event being down at the, at the cool insuring arena. So uh, it was great. You know, downtown Glens Falls was, was very busy. I got some friends that, you know, owned the bullpen and, you know, they were caught off guard a little bit how, how busy they were. I know the hotel was and a lot of restaurants. Um, so somebody told me Stewart's ran out of ice cream one day downtown. You know, I'm not sure if that's true or not, but, you know, just the impact that event had in Glens Falls on a, a normally slow, uh, slow week. So. Um, so that, that was exciting and, you know, certainly we we're excited to have uh, events back in the building. It, it had been a long time. Um, looking forward, July, it, it's kind of a slower month, but um, we'll actually, we'll start doing cornhole events down at Heritage Hall. And we've had a couple of those small events in Heritage Hall. The ice goes in August 2nd, which is a week earlier this year than, than previous. We've got a number of uh, hockey camps, a bunch of people coming up from the Albany area to do camps with us, a couple hockey tournaments. We run our own hockey camp, the Thunder. Um, and a number of clinics. So we sell uh, an ex a lot of ice in August. Um, September 2, 3, 4, and 5, the Upstate New York Firefighters Expo will finally take place. We've had a, a couple of dates for them, and obviously COVID uh, shut us down. So that should be a really good event. Um, a lot of hotel rooms and a lot of people come to Glens Falls um, in Warren County for, the, for that event. So um, moving to September, uh, again, I, I can't announce the event. Um, Y'all are smart people. You can probably guess it but we'll have over 750 hotel rooms for about a, a 10 day event in downtown in Glens Falls. So we're excited about that again. And then, you know, we're working on a bunch of concerts and, and bigger events for late 2021, um, quarter one of 2022. So we've had a lot of phone calls lately now that, you know, New York state said we, we could open. So, so we're, we're excited about our fall, our winter and, and our spring. Certainly Thunder Hockey's back in October. We've had a great response from our our season ticket holders and our, and our business partners over the last uh, month. So we're selling a lot of tickets. Our, our business community has been tremendous. So we're excited about that. The rodeo will be back. The, the girls New York State basketball finals are back. Uh, the Section 2 basketball, which is a big event for us, is back. And um, the state boys basketball finals will finally be back after we, we lost it two, for two years. So um, year one of our first of three years. So we, we've got a lot of things going on at the arena and uh, I think we're pretty excited about the fall winter in early 2022. So happy to answer any questions if I can. Any uh, any other concerts coming up? We've got a, a bunch on hold, Kevin, um, but they're not quite confirmed. So um, we thought we had one in October, which we lost to uh, the Palace in Albany. So we've got a few on hold and you know hopefully we'll get that. We've got a couple of the big, we would consider big events on hold for early 2022. 
in the firefighters, you think you'll have uh, 700 rooms here? Or how many rooms? Oh, the firefighters, no, I think it's about three or 400 hotel rooms is what they're expecting. It's another event in late September that I, I can't give the name of yet, but it's, it's definitely over 750 hotel rooms. Yep. Okay. We've had it before. And what happened to Dr. Gator? Is he his uh, Heritage Hall concert? I think we're, we're still that? trying to get uh, Dr. Gator to, to come north. I think he lives in Florida. So uh, I, I heard he moved. Yeah. Oh. Uh, a friend of mine, he kind of coordinated it. So, so we're looking for a date for the, the CND's reunion. So I, was, I didn't know that'd be that popular, but, uh, oh, I you know, was coming back for that one. so we we're, we we're trying to get Ed Sheeran and now yeah. Dr. Gator. So, yeah. so, so hopefully we can get a, uh, get Dr. Gator back. I thought you wanted the heavy metal. No, no, no. I like Gator. I used to go. I, to I didn't know he moved though. I, didn't know. I heard he was living in Florida, but oh, you know, I can't yeah. confirm that. Mm -hmm. Any uh, any other questions for Jeff on the on the Civic Center or cool? No, oh, Ryan, Ryan. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Yeah, so just from a COVID uh, standpoint, um, the, uh, the the cutoff when the governor uh, uh, dispensed with the remaining COVID uh, regulations, the cutoff for uh, entertainment venues to still have some regulations was five thousand attendees. So. You know, we come in right under that. We're, good. We're, 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 we're in a good position. We're fortunate. Yeah, there was a lot of different guidelines as to the size of our building for the year. So uh, we finally got some good news, as Ryan said. Yeah. A, we waited a long time for that. Yeah, we were big. We were small. We were in the middle. So I think we're, right now we're, we're okay where we are. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. And also, I forgot to mention, uh, back uh, June 22nd, we received a letter from Mayor Blaze thanking us for supporting the fireworks. That they're having at uh, Lake George. I guess they're pretty popular. Uh, I guess the next would be the Granius uh, short term rental compliance. Um, is, are we ready for that? Joanne? Uh, Bruce McCaskill is online and he will share his screen and he has a presentation. Okay. Bruce, are you with us? I am. I'm here. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Okay, can you see my screen okay? <clears throat> yep, okay, perfect. Fine. Perfect. Well, thanks for everybody uh, joining today and let me uh, participate. I really appreciate it. Um, the goal today, I'm going to send you this deck when I get done, but I want to give you an insight into um, some data that I pulled. I'll show you what actually uh, the short term rental market looked like inside Warren County in May. And then I did an actual poll uh, yesterday morning to show you an update on that. And I'm just going to do a quick demo to just give you an idea of how we collect this data and then turn that data into meaningful and useful data so that you can make informed decisions and take action. And then third, um, hopefully I can show, show you how um, what Supervisor Leggett alluded to, how we can help increase your tax collection efforts to fund your broadband match. So I'm going to go ahead and jump in here. Um, just give you a quick background of who Granicus is. Um, uh, Granicus, uh, we're part of uh, host compliance as part of Granicus. Granicus uh, currently works with about 3,500 different municipalities and federal um, agencies as well. And then from a um, government perspective, uh, host compliance started about six years ago. And back then there was really no software or, or platforms out there to really address short-term rentals. And what, am I, what I mean by addressing short-term rentals is being able to identify um, who those hosts are, where they're located, what sites they're on, then matching that up with your assessor data so that you have all that data. Um, over the last six years, we've grown pretty significantly. We're up to about 375 different municipalities throughout the U.S. I'll go ahead and show you next who we're currently working with in New York. So here's just a list of our current customers in New York, the different counties and cities as well. And um, if, you know, after this uh, presentation, if anybody wants any uh, contacts, if you want to reach out to any of our current customers, just let me know. I can get you that information. So I'm going to jump into, um, go ahead and show you what I pulled uh, as of May, my previous meeting with the county. And I'll explain these numbers because some of this uh, is our language. Um, we currently scan, we're up to about 65 different short-term vacation rental platforms that we scan. So everything from Craigslist to Airbnb, HomeAway, VRBO, et cetera, international sites as well. And this is what I pulled actually is kind of towards the end of May. This is kind of the count of what was actually active in that time frame. That number where it says 1810, that's going to be the average advertised site. So the number of listings, that's going to be the Airbnb, HomeAway, uh, VRBO, tripping, et cetera. 
And then below that, that number 1345, where it says unique rental units, that's going to be the properties themselves. So at that time and point in May, there was a 1,345 properties that were actively renting through those sites. Now, the difference between those two numbers, uh, which is about 465, um, those are what we call duplicates. So that what that gives you an indication of is there's um, about 465 hosts or owners that are advertising their their house on multiple platforms at the same time. So they're advertising their house on maybe Airbnb and HomeAway and tripping at the same time. And that's kind of where you get that difference in those numbers. So I'll take a break for a second to see if there's any questions. No questions? Okay, perfect. Uh, Supervisor uh, Leggett has a question. Thank you. Absolutely. Some, some bona fide motels and B&Bs advertised on those sites. Are those included? No, th those are not included. These are going to be short-term rentals only, properties that are short-term rentals only. So we don't include um, uh, any type of bed and breakfast or hotel rooms. Good. Did I answer your question, Supervisor Leggett? Yes, thank you, Bruce. Sure, you're welcome. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and show you what I pulled this morning, or actually yesterday morning. Um, so here's the numbers from yesterday morning. So you did have a slight increase, about 10% uh, over the last 60 days. So currently, as of yesterday, and this is kind of a live and you know, what I call a time and date snapshot. So this was who was actually active and online yesterday morning. Uh, there was 1,927 listings, and then there was 1,420 properties. So as of yesterday. Wow, that's good. So, and I'll show you the difference here in just a second. Um, Want to give you a little bit of data behind that. <clears throat> so the average nightly rate was about $300 a night. So across those 1,429 properties, uh, the average cost was about $300 per night. And then if you look below here in the unit types, you'll see a breakdown of partial homes and entire homes. Uh, this gives you a good indication if that owner is actually present. So about 91% uh, were renting out their entire home. Now that could be somebody who has a second home with inside the county that's running it out maybe during special events or seasonality. But it's also a good indication of people who bought properties um, you know, for full-time rentals. This is a full-time short-term rental business. And then over to the left, you'll see kind of a breakdown of the actual properties themselves. So about 89% were single family homes and about 9% were multifamily homes. <clears throat> Any questions on this information here? No, no, we okay. can go ahead. Okay, perfect. Uh, just to show you, um, and this is just the growth over the last 60 days. So like I mentioned, um, percent growth. So this is showing the number of listings. So this would be the advertised sites. You went from about 1810 in May um, to yesterday about 1927. So about a 10 percent growth. And then on the actual properties themselves, about a nine and a half percent growth. So you went from 1345 properties online back in May to yesterday about uh, 1429 properties. So you're seeing a little bit of steady growth and things are still going. Um, just to give you perspective, uh, last year during kind of the height of COVID 2020, um, we saw uh, a small percentage drop from March until May, about 3% of short-term rentals that were currently listed across the country for 375 customers. Only about 3% actually pulled their listings down. And then from June forward, we saw a 10% increase each quarter. So the average growth over the last three quarters that we've seen kind of nationwide has been a 10% each quarter, so 30% growth. Oh. Any questions? Go ahead. Yeah, Bruce, uh, Supervisor Beatty. Um, yes. Uh, obviously, the 10% or 9.5% growth in rental mm -hmm. unit growth from uh, July to May, the track opens. The track is a huge draw, plus the fact mm -hmm. that our peak seasons is July and August. Sure. So, um, it wouldn't shock me if there's a slight growth increase in August over July. Uh, Correct. That, you know, and then I would suspect that we would see a major, not a major, that's maybe the wrong word, but a significant drop from September to August in available, uh, available units. Now, would you right. concur with that or, or do you know our area that well or? No, so actually I've got some data. I'll pull some data. So we do um, scans every quarter, pretty much in every county in the U.S., so what I'll do as a follow up when I send this deck is I'll get you numbers from um, the last couple of years. So you can kind of see that. So you can see where that goes up and down. Would that, would that help be beneficial? Yeah, for Warren Perfect. County. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay. okay. Thank you, Bruce. You're welcome. You're welcome.
Okay, um, so I'm gonna go ahead. We've got a lot of slides here in essence of time. I'm gonna go ahead and jump into a demo, show you how a demo works. And then I'm gonna show you actually a Dutchess County site. Um, they use us for their tax collection. So give me one second here while I change over screens. Okay, can everybody see this screen okay? Mm -hmm. Perfect, okay. So this is, um, this is a demo of our software. So this is what it actually looks like. I just wanted to show you kind of how we collect this data and then turn this data into useful data so you can make informed decisions and take action. Um, so this is what we call a home screen or kind of the home page. Um, and the idea behind it is to put all the relevant information on a single page. So when you first log in, you can take a quick glance and see what's going on currently with inside your jurisdiction within the county. Um, just for example, and this is just a, um, like I said, a demo account. Um, over to the left here, this number 67, this is gonna show the total number of short-term rental units that would be current um, with inside your jurisdiction. Um, so this changes all the time. So this is not a stagnant number as um, hosts are coming on the different platforms or if they're taking their listings down, this will reflect the change in those numbers. So when you log in, you're gonna be able to see in real time who's currently online. Um, below here, so I gotta move my screen around a little bit. Um, below here is more informative data. So breakdown of bedrooms, bathrooms, if you have any type of occupancy level requirements, um, whether it's based on sewer or parking or septics, um, you'll be able to see that if people are exceeding your occupancy levels. Mm -hmm. um, you'll be able to see compliance status. Um, so typically not in the county level, but if you have a registration for tax purposes, you'll be able to see who's currently registered for um, tax and who's not. Um, you'll be able to see the number of nights that are being rented. So in this area, about 91% of all the listings were less than seven nights. Um, you know, which is an indication, obviously, short-term rentals are less than 30 days. And then below here, you'll see more detailed information on the breakdown of the actual houses and uh, properties themselves and the actual property types as well. Um, over here is what we call kind of uh, rental units over time. So this will give you good indication. Um, like yeah, I just mentioned a minute ago, right, during your different seasonality, you can kind of see the spikes. Um, what we do is once we identify a short-term rental, we go out and we take a snapshot of their listing every two days. So we're capturing that data. So this will give you a good indication of when you're having special events, you'll see those certain spikes. So like you mentioned, you know, when you get to maybe August, September front time frame, maybe the, your uh, short-term rentals go down. Just a good indication of what's going on with inside your jurisdiction. Um, up here is basically just a Google map. The reason we use a Google map is it's really simple, kind of interactive. Most people are familiar with a Google map. Um, so this is on this map here, uh, these are a breakdown of all the actual addresses and hosts where they're located. Now, the, um, this customer wanted everything kind of in different colors and different shapes based on what they were looking for. Um, they're looking for registration. So everything in red and a square is a short-term rental we've identified that's not currently registered. Um, just like a Google map, you can go down into satellite view and you can go down to street level so you can see exactly where these short-term rentals are located and know exactly where they are within down to block level. Now I'm gonna show you next, um, back here real quick. I'm going to show you a uh, rental unit record. I'll show you why this is important. So this is where all the data is collected on that specific host or that um, specific uh, address. Let me go back here. I'm just going to pull up one random here. Let's click on this one. So if you click on this button here, it's going to take you to what we call the rental landing page. And this, and this is where all the data is stored specific to that host and that address. Um, so you'll see here the address of that actual property. We'll see that they're active currently online and we've identified them and they're not compliant. And then down here below that, you'll see their listing information. So you'll see they're actually on HomeAway and Airbnb as well. And these are their advertised numbers. So associated with each of those sites. And then below here, you'll see um, what we call match details. So we'll show you how we actually identified those properties. Um, so what we essentially do is we'll go through and we'll scan the 65 different rental platforms that are out there. And we're also scanning public sites as well. So some examples are Zillow, Redfin, Realtor.com. The reason being most of these, uh, these properties in the past have either had their house rented or maybe sold. And that data is kept forever in those real estate sites. So by coming through those sites, we're able to look for a very specific architectural details and information and data about those. And then we would take your assessor data, a download from your assessor of all the housing information, and we use our software to come through all that and then come up with an exact match. And before we give you a check mark that everything is positively identified, everything is human verified. So we have about 200 people that work for us, we call them analysts, and they're gonna go through and look in the back end and make sure that it does match up with your parcel ID, your lot number, and your address. Now below here is the listing details. This will tell you you're currently active. Here's the link to their Airbnb site. 
Um, this is an actual apartment. They're saying condominium, but it's actual rooms inside of their house. So they're renting on these rooms. Well, um, the last time we collected the information was yesterday. Uh, we actually captured, it looks like we captured a screenshot this morning. And then you'll see the price that they're charging per night. And then below here, you'll see information such as the number of nights that they're requiring to stay there. So two nights um, is the minimum. Um, occupancy level, so maximum number of people, uh, four for that total room. So two people per bedroom. And then last documented stay was um, this morning where we captured that uh, information and 47 reviews. Now, below here is what we call listing screenshot. I'll show you why this is important. I'm just going to click on here to show you what it looks like. And we don't expect you to go through and find this data. I'm going to show you how you can have this all in a report fashion, but I wanted to show you where the data is coming from so it does make sense. So this is a screenshot. And typically with Airbnb and HomeAway, each, um, each listing has about 150 data points with inside of their listing. And a lot of that data is important. So by taking these screenshots, we're ingesting all that data. And then I'll show you how we're going to put that information so it's useful to you. But just to show you some examples, you'll see descriptions, the breakdown of the rooms, what they're offering. You'll see their calendars where they're blocked off. And you also see what we call time and date stamp reviews. So by capturing all this information, let me go back here, you'll be able to see all this information, what we call a timeline of history. So let me go down here. This one's a little bit longer. Um, so this actual host first came online back in uh, 2019. And what you'll see here kind of throughout here is this is information we're capturing every couple of days. We have what we call here documented stays. So I'll explain quickly how we get a documented stay. So by scanning these, um, their listings and taking these snapshots, we're looking at their calendars, like I mentioned, and then we're looking at time and, time and date stamp reviews. And so, for example, with Airbnb or HomeAway or any of the major sites, in order for a renter to leave a review, Airbnb has to document that they actually stayed there and prove that they stayed there so they can leave a biased review. And so once they leave a review, it's going to have a time and date snapshot on there. So by matching up their calendars with their time and date snapshot, we're able to provide what we call documented stays. So this will be the documented stays they stayed during the time period. So as you can see here, for example, in October, they had 13 documented stays. Um, the reason that's important, and I'm not saying you know, hosts are dishonest, 90% of hosts want to do the right thing and go through that process. Um, it just, just helps if somebody says, for example, I'm, you know, I'm, you, my calendar was marked off because I'm running to my cousin or to family members. Um, you know, trying to kind of get around paying their taxes sometimes or trying to get around those actual uh, stays that they have. It's just a good way to document and have that information. Um, you'll also be able to see when they took their listings down and then reposted it. So you'll see here quite a bit of um, activity going on. Um, the reason that happens sometimes is if they've rented that, that property for, you know, a week or so and they immediately take it down, it's very hard for code enforcement or someone else to kind of capture that information. Um, a good example is Nashville. I used to live in Nashville and uh, really big on special events. So like the Country Music Awards was for a week uh, out of the year. And I had a lot of friends who would rent their house out for three or four grand for the week and just go to a hotel room. Well, they would put their listing up for, you know, 24 to 48 hours, um, rent their house out and then take it down and not put it back on, you know, for a year later. So it was very hard for Nashville to capture that data. And there was hundreds of thousands of dollars of uh, tax revenue that's being generated just during that week for that one event. So that's where it kind of gets important to understand, you know, that documentation of when they're actually running, who's staying there and documenting those stays. So all this information is with inside of our system. It's very easy. I just want to show you where it comes from. Uh, like I mentioned, we don't expect you to go look at every single, um, you know, listing, but um, you'll see here, you know, parcel number, where they're from. This person is from out of town, uh, the owner's address. So they're not a local person renting. And just a breakdown of all that information. So I'll take a quick break for a second. I know it's a lot of information. Um, any questions so far? Uh, no, Bruce. Um, okay. I'm going to take over for Mr. Garrity. He had to be called out on something. So, uh, sure. Any other questions from the committee? Joanne, did you have a question? I do. Okay. Yes. Okay. No questions. Keep going, Bruce. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. So I'm going to switch over screens one more time. I just want to show you. Dutchess County, jump over here, find your screen, sorry. Let's see. Um, so for Dutchess County, we actually provide um, a registration portal and tax collection for them. Um, and so we build this, and I'll show you what it looks like here. This is their actual website, and this is live. Go down here and click on register and pay, hotel tax, and it'll bring us to their um, 
tax collection registration site. So we built this for them. Um, and this, uh, we build this not only online, but it's also smartphone enabled. So it gives the opportunity for that host to register and pay their taxes from any device that has an internet. So they can use a computer, a laptop, um, an iPad, or an actual smartphone, you know, a iPhone or um, any type of phone and go through that whole registration process directly through their phone if they need to. Um, it's pretty simple. Now, this is all custom built, so it's all based on your needs and kind of your back end flow. So what kind of documentation that you're collecting and how you want to collect that. Um, this is live, so I'm just going to kind of click through here a couple times to show you how it works, but I can't go through the complete thing because it is a live site. Um, so if somebody clicks and they want to register as a short-term rental to pay their, their um, occupancy tax, they click on this button here and identify their role. So they can, if they're a property manager, we can do this for multiple properties at the same time. If it's the owner, they would just click on I'm the owner, and they would ask for their parcel ID. And if they don't have their parcel number, they can just go to the assessor's office to pull that information up. And then um, I can't click through it. I don't have a parcel number with me to go through their site. But I just want to give you an idea of kind of how the flow works. Um, they put the parcel ID in and then we actually go get registered and then they can pull up their, their uh, revenue and pay their taxes. So that's something that we do offer. Now, we're not, not in the credit card business, but we would um, provide a partnership with Stripe. Uh, we use Stripe because they're the largest uh, online and most secure. Um, they, they, um, they, they pass all the regulations for both state, local and federal and the cost would be to um, uh, process a credit card or, for example, an e-check. So an e-check is 0.08% with a $5 max. So that cost would go on to that actual host or owner to pay um, when they pay for their taxes. And then the money would go into the county's um, bank account in typically 24 to 72 hours. So typical ACH debit. So any questions on, on the actual uh, tax collection website? I see none, Bruce. No, okay, okay, perfect. Okay, um, I'm gonna go back to the last piece here. I'll show you pricing, the breakdown of pricing, so it makes sense. Uh, slide. Give me one second. I've got two things to show you in the pricing because I've got, um, Warren County is a member of NCPA, which is the National Cooperative Purchasing Alliance in New York. So I'm just gonna share our traditional pricing then I'm gonna show you the NCAPA pricing. Um, so uh, our pricing is pretty simple. It's based on the number of listings that you have and then rental units that you have. So for example, address identification, um, you currently had about 1,920 listings. And then with the permit and registration and tax collection portion of this, that would be $8 based on the number of rental units you have 1,425. So that's on an annual basis. Um, we lock that in for 12 months. So uh, regardless if there's any changes and listings coming off and on during special events, if it ever exceeds that amount, we're not going to charge you anything additional because we lock it in for 12 months. Let me show you what it looks like from an annual perspective. Um, so this would be a breakdown of the annual pricing typical, uh, what our typical pricing model is. So the address identification, which is everything that I showed you today, except for the portal itself, would be 43493 and then the permit and registration and tax collection uh, would be 11,400. And, the, and then rental activity monitoring is where we're identifying the number of nights they've rented and the revenue associated with that, that's 21,000 per year. So this is our typical pricing, but I wanna show you what the NCPA pricing looks like because that's the more relevant pricing. So give me one second, I've gotta pull this up on a separate screen here really quickly. And here's the screen here. Can everybody see this okay? Sorry, I've got so many screens open. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So this is um, this would be on the NCPA contract 01-115 um, as part of their procurement. NCPA, just to let you know what they do is um, they vet through and they actually do RFPs and they choose an RFP winner based on their requirements um, and then the actual pricing and they lock that into a contract. So we're, we're under contract 01-115. And here's the pricing, let me show you over here, actual NCPA pricing. Sorry, I may just take a second, it's running a little bit slow. <clears throat> I shut some other pages out, I think I got too many pages open.
Well, I have a question for you, Bruce, when you're done. Yes. Uh, well, we can take the question now then. Go ahead, Joanne. Uh, Bruce, the, yes. the county and the tourism department subscribe to analytics through AirDNA. Is there any mm -hmm. overlap of data that is in what you're offering that I might already receive from AirDNA? Mm -hmm. No, no, no. So AirDNA, um, we actually worked with them probably about six years ago, kind of partnered with them on certain aspects. But um, typically, AirDNA is more towards uh, investors and short-term rental owners. Um, it gives them a good grasp of what the average nightly rate is, um, what they can charge, um, what the market's bearing, and, and specific to time period. So yeah, we're totally um, on a different angle from that. But I get supply, demand, rev par, you know, similar. Right, things. right, right. Exactly. Yeah, it's more geared towards, like you said, so more geared towards the, the host or those owners themselves. So they can align their pricing model to be competitive with other short-term rentals. But I do but see, similar. Mm -hmm. I do see that at a countywide level. So I'll see in Warren County mm -hmm. there are X number of hosts and how much uh, mm -hmm. rev is collected every month. So there are some, right. some countywide data. That yeah, there, yeah, there's some similarities. Yeah, 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 yeah. They do have a little bit of similarities in there. Well, I apologize, it's not coming up, but I can tell you what the pricing was based on scene. So, what I was showing you a minute ago. Let me just go back to that it's really quick. I apologize, my internet. It just, I think I got too many screens open this time. Okay, so um, the address identification on the NCPA contract would be twenty four thousand. Um, so it's almost half of that forty three, and then the permit registration is nine. So um, it, it's uh, and I'll get that. What I'll do is I'll um, print a contract out and then send it with this, so you can see the actual pricing. But it's, it's pretty significant discount based on NCPA con uh, contracts. Okay, and the one area, uh, Joanne, do you think maybe a little bit overlap? What one would that be on that? Uh, the rental activity monitoring. I would just like to mm -hmm. see a sample of what he's providing for rental activity sure. monitoring. And I'll take a look at what I get from your DNA. Okay. Thank no, you. sure. No, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Are there other questions for Bruce? Seeing none, uh, did you want to add anything else, Bruce? Thank you very much. It was no. well done and uh, very informative, to say the least. And uh, are you, just on a side note, are you uh, doing business with Glen Falls, or, or have you been talking with them at all yet? Glen Falls, yeah, I've met with Glen Falls, um, Queensbury, with both, both, both areas. Okay, because mm -hmm. I know... Right, that, they, they actually gave me an introduction into, um, into the county, so... Okay. I all have right. a... I have we'll hold that against you. That's right. I have a question now from uh, Supervisor Hogan. Go ahead. Um, Absolutely. Are these unique licensing agreements, or would this be able to be shared among the municipalities in the county? That's up to you. So the way it works is the data is your data. So um, we do have counties that share information. That would be totally up to you if, if you want to share that information with each of those municipalities. Now, I can tell you from experience, most cities and towns are interested in registration because that's typically where they're driven when they're registering short-term rentals if they have an ordinance in place. And typically, like you mentioned, the county collects the taxes. So it's usually two different pieces of the puzzle, but you can surely share that information if you'd like to. Did that answer your question? Absolutely. Thanks. Okay, perfect. Well, I, I know you've got a lot of time today. I appreciate everybody uh, letting me come on today. I'm gonna, I'll am gonna, i get this deck together, send it over. I'll look at some of the historical data as well. And then I'll send you over the NCPA pricing as well. Super. Thank you very much, Bruce. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate your time. Have a great day. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Goodbye. Um, Supervisor Garrity had to leave, like I mentioned. So we're gonna, we don't have a quorum. So unfortunately, we're not going to be able to pass anything today. But that was your Mike yes. Swan Mr. Swan. Uh, this would greatly impact my office, obviously, if we're trying to get all this information about who is doing short term rentals. Um, so I, I have no great allegiance to this particular company. Um, that's a decision that you people should be making. But I think it's a decision that we have to make. I think we need to get this information in order for me to get the collections to where they should be. Um, so 
Um, and I've done quite a bit of research with Granicus. They seem to be pretty much doing what they say that they're going to do. Um, so I have confidence that, and I'm not trying to say that that's the company we should go with. There are others out there, but um, all the feedback I'm getting is, is that they are doing, they do what they say they're going to do. Okay. Um, and regardless, uh, regarding uh, sharing the information that uh, Supervisor Hogan was talking about, we're already sharing our information with Lake George and Warrensburg. They give us, when they get a registration, we send them the information when we get a registration. So we've already got that going on. Um, my suggestion would be that, that if we can get into a situation with a company like this, I would share the information with the towns as long as we're not violating a contract, obviously. That's why I asked. Yeah. <laughs> would, you, would you also want to do the online pay option with them? No, not right now. Um, I, and mainly because when I, the, the conversations I've had with Bruce is I don't know that they can get it to the town the way I need to do it because we have to redistribute back based on what's collected in the town. And I'm not sure that they're able to do that as well as we can do it. So right now let's get the information and then look at collection next year um, and see where we're going. Since, since we're a somewhat smaller group, can I just share that I'm, I'm getting quite a bit of feedback from short-term rentals owner, owners that they're having trouble registering with your office and making their payments? Uh, I have not heard that. I, I'll be, tell them to call me directly, okay? I do. Um, <laughs> but I haven't had... <laughs> I haven't had very many calls about people having problems registering or, or getting the money to us. I, that surprises me. But if there's a problem, I want to know about it so we can correct it. Well, we all know I'm easier to bitch at than you are. So, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, Supervisor. We have. I will tell you that we have had problems getting some of the certificates back to people because we've just been buried with them. But as far as the collections go, um, uh, I lost. I had another thing I wanted to say and forgot what it was. Oh, um, I know that he's talking with the city of Glens Falls and the town of Queensbury. Um, Lake George already has a contract with them. Uh, I don't know how that should all work out, whether we, we want to do something well, that, that's as a group. I, I don't know. That's what I was going to ask. If, does it make sense to have individual contracts with Glens Falls, and Queensbury, Lake George? If we as a county have one contract and we share the information, why, why do the individual towns? I mean, that's an that, unneeded I, expense. I don't know. That's yeah. something that, right. that somebody uh, needs to work on. Uh, Supervisor Leggett, then Mr. Moore, then uh, Chairwoman. Okay. Uh, thank you, Vice Chairman Beatty. The uh, town of Chester lo looked into this through Granicus, and it is pretty impressive on what they're able to do. From a town standpoint, we're not collecting taxes. What we're looking at is the health, safety, and welfare. So we are using them to get uh, a list of addresses to and have them register. And this is what Warrensburg and Lake George are doing and having them inspected by building codes for their fire safety. It can also go through zoning to make sure that the septic system and, and the load on the house is, is correct. For example, you could have a short term rental um, being advertised. This could fit 16 people, but it's a um, house that's been designed for a, a, a three bedroom, six people uh, septic system. And those are what we are concerned with. So really the with Granicus, any contract that a town would have for them is to be able just to get those addresses so we can get them uh, permitted, know their locations, and make sure that they're following the compliance for the health, safety, and welfare. Well, Not couldn't we supply budget. you those addresses? If yeah, because you could, that's, yeah, if you could, that would be That's safe. basically the only thing that at this point that I'm interested in on the county level is the addresses, the locations of them. And if, as like I said, as long as it's legal, with the contract, whatever contract, I have no problem sharing that with the municipalities. How much would you charge? Nothing. <laughs> That's a good number, isn't it? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> By the way, take your get form that on off. record. <laughs> yeah, you can have. Yeah, you've got me on record saying that. No, there's. I, I can't see the point in charging for that information. Um, it, I mean, the money to pay for this is going to come out of tourism. It's going to come out of occupancy tax. So why should we be charging the towns? For that, I mean, that's my thought. That obviously the board has to make that final decision, but 
my recommendation would be we share the information and don't worry about selling it to you. Yeah, I personally, I would like that too, um, that the towns are able to access this information. It's one less cost for each town and uh, and uh, this is something that's countywide. So that I'd support that, but I can't speak to the whole board. Ryan, did you want to make a comment? I, I did, just in terms of how to structure this going forward. I do think that uh, doing something along these lines does make sense. I think that it's a, a goal that uh, we should support and try to get it done. I just I view this as the three departments being involved, the tourism department's the lead. Um, I, I want what, whatever vendor we choose and whatever um, intermunicipal structure we can work with, with the other towns. Um, I want to make sure that the tourism department first and foremost is comfortable with that, but also on the scope of services, we need the treasurer to be, to be comfortable with what it is that we're asking Granicus to do yep. no more, no less. And uh, the purchasing department is the third department. We just need to make sure that whatever uh, uh, cost structure we put into place and the vendor selection itself is, is done uh, according to our purchasing policies. Thank you, Ms. Moore. Mr. Chairman. Chairwoman Sieber, did you want to make a comment? I, I just have a couple quick questions. Okay, then Ms. Holt. Um, oh, one, would this fall under professional services according to our procurement policy, or do we have to bid, go out to bid for this? Uh, I, I think it would fall under professional services under our policy, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it has to go out for a bid if, if we can right. piggyback off of something else. Okay. So um, that, that's, that's, that'll be up to them to do that policy and legal analysis. My second question would be, what avenue do we have available to us today without a quorum to move this forward without waiting additional months? I would suggest that we have try to schedule another meeting of this committee before uh, the, the August meeting, because we, we, have, we have additional items on the agenda today that we won't be able to take action on. Okay. Um, yes, I concur. We probably are gonna need another tourism uh, our tax meeting uh, really soon because of our lack of form. Yes, Chairwoman? I just, I have a different suggestion as it relates to this particular aspect of the meeting. It would have to go through finance regardless. Isn't there a way, given the members that are here today, um, to be able to also list it on the finance agenda? It, you know, it, it's something that we've been talking about for several months where I'm glad to see that we did a presentation today. It's certainly viewable to all of our members. And our treasurer's office has talked about how much this would also help their office. I had an opportunity to speak with this company down at our national conference as well and, and asked about just different feedback that we've heard um, from other counties. And, you know, I, I, we're even calling a joint meeting well, I, around finance. Well, but how about gotta, if we ask our county attorney, is that, is that possible that this gets past the finance? I don't for Granicus, or are we talking about the subsequent item the, um, for Granicus? I'm only talking about Granicus. I don't know that it does have to go through finance. I don't think that finance has has. I don't. I don't. I don't know that there's uh, a. Involved. If they need a source of funding, yeah. it would have to go to finance. Right. If we need a budget amendment. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. So, and I don't know how this. We haven't talked about structure of payment yet so exactly yeah we don't i mean if we had a proposal that, that had a cost affixed to it we, we may i i don't i just don't know that we're going to be there okay um best routes to have another meeting i, I think so yeah, that's gonna be i our, think so correct. yeah because finance is only it's only nine days from now i don't know that we'll be there by then yeah. maybe maybe uh we can uh ask chairman garrity if he'd schedule a meeting before finance on in nine days, no, yes. Well, it, it, we have time to, to post it if Garrity agrees. Right after personnel, we do hot tax and then we go to finance. I mean, that's that to me. So, um, it's that's why I brought up the administratively the three departments working together. That's that's some work that's got to get done, and that's that's my concern on the timetable is does. Do those steps fit that timetable? Okay, right. so can I, we reach out then to Mr. Garrity and mm -hmm. ask him to yeah. schedule and, and, and explain if he has questions, why does he need that? You could yeah. answer that, thank you. And between personnel Yes, uh, personnel, then OCTAX, and then finance that day. Okay, does everybody go with that? You go? Yeah. Yeah. Go I've all already been having conversations with Mike and with Julie Butler and purchasing, so we're, okay. we've moved that along fairly 
really yeah, good. So Julie has an answer talk. about, I, I, I sure. she's told me what it is, but I'm not going to say it. It's, okay. it's her job. We have, okay. a, we have options. <laughs> okay. Yeah, there are, there are options. And as long as uh, Bruce can get us what he was talking about with the contract, yeah. um, I think Julie and the rest of us are pretty much ready to roll. Right. Okay. So we're, we're in a good spot. Great. Okay, so let's make that happen in nine days then. And we get all that together. <clears throat> um, Joanne, do you have well, a question? Just the other two agenda items. Do we need another yes. meeting for that? Well, yeah. Why don't we just roll those into the next OCTAX next meeting? Month. Does that oh, make sense? No, 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 no. That's oh. personnel. Oh, in that same sure. meeting. May I? Yes. I'm, I'm violating all kind of rules. Um, you are. <laughs> I know it's been a long day. We've certainly gotten through a lot and it's unfortunate we're at this point without a quorum. However, um, in the interest of not adding another meeting day to our agenda um, and everyone's schedules, perhaps at the time we add the OCTAX that's meeting, that's we it. could take up these other two items. Exactly. Is that your understanding? That's, that's, that's what I thought you were asking, Joe. Is that a, appropriate? I just don't want to wait a whole nother month. Because right now there's only two in the committee, myself and Chairwoman Seaver. I would think that we just add those two items in nine days to the OCTAX meeting. So we have the three items we're going to have to have action on. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we roll over to finance. Seems simple. Is that okay, Administrator Moore? I think that's probably the most sensible thing that we can do in the, in the interest of moving these issues sure. along. Okay. Um, that being said, though, may I just say something quickly? I get Feel to be free. a member right now. Um, and you don't have many left. I think it's just us. It's you and um, I. So. I just wanted to say I I'm leaving. I um your the work that tourism and the community and your partners have done into this OCT tax application it is nothing short of remarkable. I'm really so excited about being able to share this with our members, with our community, and with those that it's going to impact. You've all done an incredible job. You should be very proud of it, and I hope for support when we come back together in nine days. So uh both the drafts which is uh 4e and 4f will wait and then uh uh joanne uh how do you feel on the pending item seeing that there's only one real committee member and one ad hoc committee member i mean well so really um i was looking at the pending items and special event funding scoring and the octax application really are things that are on the agenda now anyway uh, the other was the municipal agreement, and as soon as we get through the couple of things that are on the uh, agenda now for those two documents, I know Kristen has already started working on that municipal agreement, so we're not ready to address that now, but that could be the August meeting, uh, item C okay. under pending items. Okay, so, so you, you're, you're comfortable with that going on to the meeting in nine days, is that what you're yes. saying? Okay. Yep, carry over. Okay, well, uh, committee. Uh, <laughs> Um, I don't even think we need to adjourn, seeing that we have just. Uh, uh, so, without further ado, we're gonna we're set for nine days. Hopefully, we're gonna take a lot of these items to that uh, next meeting. Then we'll have finance right after it. Hopefully, we we'll get this ball rolling fairly quickly. Uh, makes sense to me. I know um, more information. It didn't seem to me very. Didn't seem to me that expensive. You know, I mean, uh, actually. It's the first slide, they made a mathematical error. <laughs> and it was only like half. And I, I, I was sitting there because we went through this first presentation once before. Um, I calculated, I did it a few times. But anyway, no, it's the, the price is reasonable. Um, that contract, that's going to work fine. And I think off the record, I think the movie is fine. I want to say that. Sure to say that. Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm as chairman, uh, vice chair of this committee now, I'm going to officially close.